thank you so much for the kind introduction and uh, let's jump right in. So the topic today is going to be um, diffusion-based generative models. And uh, you know, this is one of the hottest topic uh, in AI. Uh, there's been an incredible amount of progress in the last few years in uh, technologies that can essentially synthesize media content automatically. Uh, think of these as models that can essentially generate text, they can generate images, they can generate video, they can generate music, they can generate audio. Um, images perhaps uh, is, is what I consider to be one of the most exciting uh, applications of these models. Uh, text to image models have been uh, become extremely powerful over the last two, just few months. Uh, there's been a number of systems that have been developed in industry, um, systems that you might have heard about like DALI2, Imagen, uh, Stable Diffusion, and uh, they are all based on a core technology called diffusion or score-based generative models, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But fundamentally, you know, these models can take a caption, something like teddy bears working on new AI research on the moon in the 1980s. This is from the DALI2 system, and uh, they can synthesize an image uh, that uh, is supposed to be faithful to this to this caption. And you can see some of the amazing results you can get with these systems down here. Uh, you know, presumably this kind of image does not exist on the internet, so the models are not simply just regurgitating what they've been trained on and something they found on the internet. Uh, but they are still able to synthesize images that are realistic. Uh, they are they're uh, pretty faithful to the caption, and uh, uh, you know this is of course super exciting because it could revolutionize the way we generate content, we personalize videos and music and uh, maybe even movies eventually or websites. And uh, you know it's all done automatically by an AI system. You just provide a caption and it generates an image. So there's all kinds of super interesting applications of these uh, of these technologies. So how do they work? Uh, at the end of the day, you know you can think of them as data simulators. You know, we know data is critical in a lot of uh, you know machine learning, AI, data science more broadly. That's kind of like the key input that you need whenever you you, uh, you, you, you want to build a, a system that is leveraging data, you need data, right? Just by definition. That's why it's been fueling a lot of the advances that we've seen in that we've seen in ML. And a data simulator is just a piece of software that can be used to produce new data. And uh, this is uh, this is useful for several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, once you have access to this data simulator, then you can generate new data sets. You know, for example, in different settings. Uh, you, you know, you can provide uh, some controls to the user, like a caption, or maybe the time of the day, or maybe some other kind of conditioning signal that is provided that is provided by the user. And this data simulator can generate new data that corresponds to those situations that maybe you didn't have access to in your training set. And the other thing you can do is uh, typically these data simulators allow you to uh, evaluate the probability that a particular data point uh, belongs to this to this data generating process. And, uh, you know, data simulators, they have a lot of different names. If you come from a statistical background, you can just think of them as statistical models. Uh, in machine learning, we tend to call them generative models. And uh, in, you know, this talk, we're going to be thinking specifically about deep generative models, where we use deep neural networks to represent this uh, piece of code, this piece of software that can be used to generate new data or kind of like evaluate how probable how likely different data points are under this data simulating uh, procedure. Uh, now, once you have access to this kind of data generating process, uh, this generative model, you can do many very interesting things. As we mentioned before, you can control the generative process through uh, different kind of inputs. Maybe you can control it through a caption, like the example we've seen before, or you know, if you're interested in generating um, artistic content maybe you can provide the user the ability to specify some kind of sketch then you can use the generative model to synthesize a painting like or a realistic or photographic like quality images uh, that are consistent with this kind of sketch that is provided by the user or you know if, again as we've seen before if you have a generative model that has been trained on a lot of different paintings and can generate uh, images that look like paintings uh, then you can specify a caption like the one we see here, and then you can let the model produce new paintings that don't exist uh, 
uh, that, that have never been you know, seen before. So they're creatively generated by the model uh, based on the specification that is provided by the user through some caption, through some text, through some prompt. And as you can see, you know, these results are pretty incredible, pretty amazing. The quality of the images is very high. And, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, again, these are images that are synthesized by a machine, by a computer. And uh, you know, there's many other applications of generative models. Uh, if you have a generative model uh, of medical images, so you have this procedure that, can, that, that can understands the structure of medical images, uh, you can use it to improve the way we um, uh, we collect data in, in, in the medical imaging, and you can use the generative model to reconstruct medical images that correspond to measurements that we might get from an MRI machine or a CT scan machine. Uh, the, the fact that the model knows what medical images look like can be leveraged to uh, synthesize images that are of high quality while reducing the amount of radiation, the amount of measurements that you can take on a, on a real patient. Uh, another application of the fact that you can evaluate probabilities of different kinds of inputs according to the model is outlier detection. So if the model knows to generate images, then it also knows which images are realistic and which ones are not. And so you can use it to detect, for example, that you know, this looks like a real uh, speed limit sign that you might see on a highway, uh, while this one might be uh, something that has, has been tampered with. And uh, so it should be given low probability by the model. And you can use this to identify the fact that, okay, maybe we're being fed another serial example or an outlier. We should be doing something special here. Uh, we shouldn't just trust the prediction of a some machine learning model blindly on this kind of input because this input is weird. And once you have the capability of generating images, of generating inputs, uh, then you can start doing these kind of things that you couldn't do with a traditional uh, discriminative model. So what's the basic uh, uh, problem here? The basic problem that we have is to uh, build this generative model using data. Right? So, we, for example, we might have access to a lot of images of dogs, like the one you see here. And the goal is to come up with a, this machine that can generate uh, new images of dogs. And the key underlying building block is some kind of estimate of the underlying data distribution. So, you can think of this very high dimensional space of all possible images. Here I'm showing it as a two dimensional kind of uh, surface, but this is just for visualization purposes. Of course, this is kind of like a toy visualization, but you can imagine there's a big space of all possible images and this according to the true underlying data distribution, and there is a true underlying data distribution according to which some images are likely, like the one you see here, the one that corresponds to dogs, and some are not so likely, uh, and those are the regions that are given low probability by this curve, maybe because they don't represent dogs, maybe because the image is not well formed, it's not spatially coherent. Right. And the goal is to basically come up with an approximation of this underlying function, which is unknown. Come up with a model that captures faithfully this true underlying data distribution. And if you have access to this model, then you can do the things we talked about before. Uh, you can sample from this model distribution. You can kind of like go around and look for high probability regions, and you can generate new data points. And uh, you can also, of course, evaluate probabilities. You can you know, check given an input, you can evaluate how high basically that surface is at different inputs, and you can use it to, to check, you know, is this a, an outlier or not? Uh, so if you have access to this model, to this function shown in green here, then you've basically solved the problem. Uh, so how do, we, how do we build this generative model? How do we build this function? Uh, the, the first uh, challenge is that as we discussed before, uh, the space of images is very high dimensional. It can have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pixels. And so there's many, 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 many different possible images, so many, many different possible inputs uh, that you need to be able to evaluate the probability of. And uh, so the question is, how do we build a space of uh, functions that are sufficiently powerful to capture these potentially very complicated data distributions? Of course, uh, you know, we could use simple model distributions like a Gaussian that would have this kind of shape or a multivariate Gaussian in this case. Uh, you can think of this as a very simple kind of neural network. It takes as input uh, an image at, which you can think as a vector of pixel intensities. 
and it gives you the probability of x according to some simple formula that corresponds to the to the Gaussian distribution. Uh, you know, of course, this is simple, this is nice, but it's not going to be good enough. As you can see, you know, it has a single mode, uh, and it's not going to be powerful enough to capture the complexity of a true data distribution. And so, in order to be able to model these real-world data distributions, we need something more complex. And a lot of the advances that we've seen in the last few uh, years has been have been leveraging deep learning, have been leveraging uh, deep neural networks to essentially uh, model this uh, um, this distribution. Let's see if I can move this off the screen okay. to model this distribution. Uh, which we're going to call p theta of x, where theta are all, are all the parameters in the neural network. Now, uh, these this kind of uh, model distributions are called deep generative models because they leverage deep neural networks to, to represent this underlying function. Uh, now, it's not so trivial to, to, to do this. Uh, and, and the reason is that you cannot just take an arbitrary deep neural network to model a probability distribution. Uh, the reason is that a you know, typical neural network you know, will take x as an input, an image as an input, and will produce, let's say, a single scalar output. Uh, but we know that probability distributions have some key properties. A probability cannot be negative. right? You cannot assign a negative probability to an image. So we need to make sure that the, all the outputs from this neural network are consistent with the fact that we're modeling a probability distribution. So they have to be no negative, for example. Now, being non negative is an easy constraint to enforce. You know, we can just do something like the exponential, uh, you know, add an extra little layer at the end, a nonlinearity that takes f theta, the output of an arbitrary neural network, and makes it non negative by exponentiating it. Uh, but that's not good enough. Uh, the other key constraint of a probability distribution is that it has to be normalized, it has to integrate to one. If you go over all possible axes and you sum the probability of all possible axes, you have to get one. Right? That's a key property of a probability distribution. And so in order to achieve that, you basically have to normalize this model. So you have to divide by this partition function, by this constant z theta, uh, which is just the integral of this normalizing constant, just the integral over all possible inputs to the model of this unnormalized probability, which is just e to the f theta. And uh, in the context of the Gaussian distribution, you know, this was that constant that you saw at the beginning of that expression and it's something that you can evaluate in closed form and that's a key advantage of using something simple like a Gaussian you can evaluate the normalization constant in closed form uh, but if you have a deep neural network that is very complicated that mapping from x to f theta it's highly nonlinear very complex uh, then evaluating this integral is going to be very very hard it's not going to be a closed form solution uh, it's not something that we can work out analytically and then figure out what is the mapping from theta to z theta to this integral. And so in practice, it's very hard to compute. It involves a high dimensional integral, uh, which is expensive and provably, uh, it can be demonstrated to be, to be provably hard to, to, to evaluate these kind of integrals. And so, and, and it's a problem that has been studied for a long time, including in, in a lot of uh, key results in the statistical physics that led to Nobel Prizes and, and things like that. So what can we do? Uh, basically, there are two, two ways to get around this. Uh, one way is to somehow represent, uh, to restrict ourselves to functional forms, to deep neural networks that have a special structure so that we can still evaluate this normalization constant in closed form. And there are classic approaches like Bayesian networks, marker random field, probabilistic graphical models from the last 20, maybe the 90s, early 2000s. There are deep models, like autoregressive models, flow models that are based on using specific architectures for the neural networks uh, that allow you to evaluate that normalization constant in closed form. Uh, the key challenge is that because you have to be normalized, uh, you know, this is imposing some strange constraints on your, on your, on your neural networks. And there is always some uh, trade-off between how flexible the functional family is and the fact that we need to be able to evaluate the partition function in closed form. And so the alternative is to avoid representing the probability distribution altogether. Instead of having a model of p theta of x, which is this function that takes as input an image and gives you the probability, uh, we can represent directly the procedure that we use to generate new data. 
This is the approach taken by implicit models, things like generative adversarial networks. Uh, and the basic idea is that instead of representing the probability distribution, we represent the sampling procedure itself. So again, we're going to use a neural network and we're going to think about all the procedures that we can get uh, if we take random noise and we feed it through a neural network. Uh, you know, this represents a sampling procedure. It's a way of transforming noise into data. And uh, you know, at this point, there is really no much constraints on the kind of neural network architectures that you can employ. Any neural network defines a valid sampling procedure. Uh, the challenge is that we can no longer evaluate, given an image, we can no longer evaluate how likely was the, this, this image under the model, right? Because you would have to figure out what are all possible noise vectors that we can feed into this neural network to produce this particular output, which is not tractable. And so these models are very hard to train. We cannot train them on maximum likelihood uh, because uh, you know, they typically involve some kind of adversarial procedure or minimax games. Uh, where we have to train a generator and together with a discriminator, they tend to be unstable and they have all sorts of issues. So the thing that really, uh, the, the key idea that really enabled a lot of the successes that we've seen in, in diffusion models uh, is an alternative approach, uh, where instead of working with the probability density function or probability distribution, which is this object that is pretty complicated because it has to be normalized because it involves a partition function, instead, uh, we're going to work with this gradient, the gradient of the log of the probability density function, something called the score or the Stein score function. And you can think uh, of uh, this as an alternative representation of the same object. Right? If P of X is something like a mixture of two Gaussians, where we have one mode on the top right, one mode at the bottom left, you, know, you can represent it as a heat map that would look like the, the, the object you see on the, the figure you see on the, on the right, where the in the color intensity, the darkness is representing the probability mass assigned to uh, two-dimensional uh, x to, by, the, by this probability density function, a mixture of two Gaussians. Uh, if you think about what is this corresponding score function, uh, well, it's a vector field. Uh, for every point, it gives you the gradient of this, of this underlying function. And it's this vector field, this, all of this, this collection of arrows that are basically pointing towards the high probability regions. Right? The gradient of the log density function is just a, it's just a vector that tells you what is the direction um, on, over which the log density function grows most rapidly. And if you think about a mixture of two Gaussians, the corresponding vector field has this kind of shape. You know, we have all these arrows that are basically pointing uh, towards the two modes of the distribution. And these two things are essentially equivalent, right? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but the, working with the score function has some key advantages. Uh, and in particular, it would allow us to bypass the fact that we need to model the, the normalization constant. So it will allow us to use very flexible uh, neural network architectures to represent the score as opposed to representing directly the probability density function, while at the same time allowing for some principal statistical methods for training the score function from data. It will allow us to uh, generate very high quality samples. Having access to the scores uh, will allow us to achieve very high quality samples that we can be controlled, for example, using text or using sketches or using other kinds of conditioning signals that we can use to steer the generating process in a particular direction. And as we will see, it will also allow us to evaluate probabilities exactly uh, according to them, unlike uh, something like generative adversarial networks. So why uh, is using the score function a good idea? Well, we know that the key problem of using a modeling directly a probability density function is that it has to be normalized. Right? You need to pick a function, uh, which in this case I'm showing as a one-dimensional function from x to p of x. And the key constraint is that you, know, you can change the shape of the function, but the area under the curve has to be one. Uh, you know, if you sum over all the possible things that can happen and you evaluate the probabilities of all the possible things that can happen, and you sum them up, you have to get one. And uh, this means that you, know, you have to impose this constraint over you know, if, if you were to pick an arbitrary neural network, that might not satisfy this constraint. And so you know, again, if you take a neural network that maps x to some value and then you're making them negative by taking an exponential, in order to get the uh, something normalized, you have to compute the area under the curve and you have to divide by it. 
to, to get a valid probability density function. And evaluating the area under the curve is easy in one dimension, but becomes very, very expensive when you have a high dimensional input X, like an image which can have thousands or tens of thousands of pixels or dimensions. On the other hand, if we look at the score function, which is just the gradient of the log of that expression on the left, uh, we see that if we take the gradient of the log of the expression we see on the left, uh, we get two components, right? We get the gradient with respect to the input of the neural network, which maps, which maps x to f of x. And then we get this gradient with respect to x of the log of the denominator, the log partition function, the log normalization constant. Recall z theta here is just the area under the curve. And we see that the area under the curve does not depend on x. It's a constant. And so whenever we take the gradient of a constant, uh, we get zero. And so that's kind of like the key thing that in order to evaluate the score, we just need to be able to evaluate the gradient of a neural network, which is something we can do very easily uh, through the backpropagation algorithm. Um, and we can use automatic differentiation packages to basically get this gradient very efficiently using existing uh, machinery, existing tools. And so that's going to be our model, right? And you can see that so like if we work directly by representing the score function, uh, we no, don't have to worry about normalization. If you look at the image at the top, uh, which is just the gradient of the curve you see on the left in the animation in the left, uh, there is no normalization constraint. Uh, basically, any function you want uh, will define a valid score function. And uh, it's much easier to model the object on the right, the score, than to model the object on the left, because we don't have to worry about normalization. And that's kind of like the key idea behind a lot of the diffusion models, modeling the score function. Now, the question is, how do we learn these score functions from data? Like we know how to go from data to, let's say we have a bunch of IID, independent identically distributed samples that were drawn from some data distribution, say images of dogs. Uh, we know how to learn a probability density function from data. There's many existing approaches to do that, but how do we get the score function? How do we get this vector field that is kind of like pointing in the directions where the data density grows most rapidly? How do we get a good approximation of the true underlying score vector field of scores of the data generation process? So specifically, let's say there is an underlying data distribution. Uh, again, I'm showing it as a mixture of two Gaussians. This is unknown. The only thing that we have access to is a bunch of data points that are sampled from this distribution. So in particular, they're going to be let's say, concentrated in top right and bottom left corners, because that's where most of the probability mass is according to the data generating process. And the question is, is there some machinery to estimate a vector field of scores, which we're going to denote as theta. This is our model family. This is going to be some deep neural network. It's a vector valued function. For every point, it will give us a corresponding vector, which is an estimate of the, of the gradient at that point. And we would like this model to be a faithful approximation of the true underlying vector field of scores of the data generating process, which we don't know. The only thing that we know about pdata is a bunch of samples. How do we do this? Given a bunch of samples from pdata, how do we estimate its score? Uh, well, we start with, we have a score model. Uh, this is going to be a family of deep neural networks, again, parameterized by theta. And uh, we would like to come up with some kind of training objective that will make this the output of this neural network as close as possible to the true uh, vector field of scores, so the, to the true gradients with respect to the, to the data generating process. How do we do this when the only thing we have access to are samples? Well, the first order of business is to decide how do we compare to vector field of scores? How do we know that we have a good approximation of the, of the ground truth score, right? So we have one ground truth vector field of scores. We have one that is produced by our neural network. It's gonna be you know, a function that for every X, it will give you a vector, which is the estimated gradient at that point. How do we know whether S theta is a good approximation of the true underlying vector field of scores? Well, the natural thing to do is to basically overlap these two vector fields. Uh, at every point, we can check you know, the ground root gradient, the estimated gradient. We can look at their difference. And if the difference is small, then the approximation is going to be good. 
uh, now we would like to get eventually some kind of scalar objective and a natural way to do this is to just say well let's look at all the errors that we've made let's look at the magnitude of these errors and average over all possible inputs and that's the objective function it's called the fisher divergence and it's just the average of the l2 distance between the true gradient and an estimated gradient at every point now it would seem that this is an objective function that is impossible to, to evaluate, it's impossible to optimize uh, because it depends on this uh, ground truth vectors, vector field of scores that we don't know. We don't have access to it. The only thing that we know is, uh, uh, the only thing we have access to is a bunch of samples from PData. So how do we evaluate this objective? How do we optimize it as a function of data to try to make our model as data as close as possible to the true Vector field of scores. Uh, it turns out that you can apply a trick, which is just integration by parts. If you remember from, from calculus, from introductory calculus, there is this trick called integration by parts uh, that allows you to rewrite an integral in a slightly different form. And if you just apply integration by parts to the objective at the top, you get an equivalent objective function, which no longer depends on this term. Uh, the, the ground truth scores, the gradient of the log data density, uh, which we didn't know how to evaluate. And we get a new objective function, which only depends on our model. There's an expectation with respect to the data distribution of uh, S, the, the, the L2 norm of S theta and the trace of the Jacobian of S theta, where S theta is this deep neural net, deep score model, this deep neural network that we use to model the vector for those scores. And the expectation with respect to the data distribution can always be approximated with a sample average. You know, we don't know what pData is, but we have a bunch of samples from it. We have our training set. And so what we can do is we can approximate the expectation with a sample average. And so at the end of the day, the objective function looks like the expression at the bottom, uh, where all you have to do is you have to go through your data points. And for every data point, you evaluate the score model. At it. You evaluate as data on xi you check the norm of the output and uh, you try you check the trace of the jacobian of s theta at that point and you try to make that expression as small as possible and intuitively what this is saying is it's trying to say look at the data points try to make sure that the estimated score the estimated gradient at the data points is small so we're kind of like trying to make them stationary points uh, we're trying to make the density flat at these points because the derivative is zero and at the same time, let's try to make the trace of the Jacobian as small as possible, which is essentially trying to make the data points local maxima for this estimated uh, vector field, which is kind of like an intuitive uh, uh, objective to, to try to fit the data density. We're going to try to make the data points that we have access to local maxima for this estimated model. Now, one challenge is that uh, evaluating this objective is still not particularly scalable. Uh, you know, you have to do two things. For every data point, you have to evaluate the norm of this vector valued function, deep neural network, takes as input x and produces uh, a, a vector, which is the estimated gradient at that point. Uh, evaluating uh, the norm of s theta squared is easy. You just do one forward pass, and, and then you take the, the, the square norm of that. That's efficient. The trace of the Jacobian is more complicated. You know, the Jacobian is this matrix where you have the partial derivatives of every output with respect to every input. The trace is the sum of the elements of the diagonal. And so to evaluate it, what you would have to do is you would have to do one forward pass, evaluate the first output of the neural network, and then do one backward pass to evaluate the partial derivative of the first output with respect to the first input. Then you to do evaluate the element, uh, the second element of the diagonal, you would have to do another forward pass, evaluate the second output of the neural network, and then do a backprop pass to figure out what is the partial derivative of the second output with respect to the second input. And you would have to do this for every possible dimension. And so naively, this would require order D backpropagations, where D is the dimensionality of the data. And again, if you have tens of, tens of thousands of dimensions, this becomes quickly extremely expensive and it doesn't quite scale. But uh, it turns out there are ways to make this efficient in practice. Uh, in particular, one particularly uh, neat way to do this is to take random projections. Instead of comparing the vector fields 
you project them down along random dimensions and you try to compare them. And after you project them down, uh, you know, you're basically working with scalars and uh, everything uh, becomes much more efficient. And of course, if two vector fields are the same, then they are also the same along random directions. Uh, but comparing vector fields along random directions is much more efficient uh, computationally, and it's still valid statistically. It still has all the good properties that we that we would expect by uh, optimizing the Fisher divergence that we had before. And right, I'm gonna skip this, but you can look at the papers if you want to read more about how this how this uh, uh, objective this approximate. Uh, these approximations work. Now, hopefully, I convinced you that these models are uh, score-based models are very flexible uh, because you know we can essentially use any neural network to model this uh, as data function that maps x to a vector, and we can train them efficiently using uh, the score matching kind of objectives. Now, the question is, how do we use this, uh, this object to generate new samples and perform controllable generation? So let's say that you've used the pipeline that we've talked about, and somehow you've been able to use data to come up with an approximation of this underlying vector field of scores. How do you use this to generate new samples? How do you use this to, uh, let's say, produce paintings, uh, produce a new painting, or produce a new human face? Uh, the basic idea is to use something called the uh, Langevin dynamics. The intuition is that these gradients are kind of like these arrows are basically telling you in which direction you should move if you want to increase the likelihood, the probability of a particular of a data point. And so one intuitive way to generate samples is to say, okay, let's initialize a bunch of particles. Let's initialize a bunch of images at random. Let me see if I can regenerate this. Video. Let's initialize a bunch of particles that are shown as blue dots here at random. And then let's follow the arrows. The arrows will tell us how we need to perturb these images to make them more likely. And by doing that, we will go towards the high probability regions, we will go towards the modes of the distribution, and uh, that should eventually produce samples. Uh, this is the right intuition. This doesn't quite produce samples, and the, and the idea is that this procedure can get stuck in local optima. Right? It doesn't explore the whole space. Uh, but it turns out there is a simple fix. Uh, you can get a valid procedure, a valid Markov chain Monte Carlo method to produce samples by essentially doing this, follow the, the arrows, follow the gradient, the estimated gradient at every point. And all you have to do is you just have to add a little bit of Gaussian noise at every step. Instead of just following the gradient, you follow the gradient plus some, some, some noise that you add at every step. And if you run this procedure long enough, it will produce samples from the, from the underlying distribution. The issue is this doesn't quite work. Uh, you know, if you try to take CIFR 10 data, you fit a score model and you try to produce Langevin dynamics, doesn't quite work. The samples that you get look like the one you see on the right, which look nothing like the images uh, we've used to train the model on the left. And uh, the reason is that, uh, you know, if you think about the go back and the way we've trained the model, right? We train the model by minimizing the objective that you see at the top, the L2 distance between the ground truth score and the, and the estimated score. We are averaging with respect to the data distribution, which means that most of the samples that we have come from the high probability regions, right? Where we're seeing a bunch of samples that are IID from the data distribution, and they all come from high probability regions. But we never actually get to see samples in practice in the low data density regions, like in between these two modes. And so it's going to be very, very hard for our neural network to figure out what is the direction that you should follow uh, when you are far away from anything that looks like a real image. What is the right way to take a bunch of random noise and make it more like uh, the model has no idea because it has never seen pure noise or or images that completely lack the right, lack the right structure during during training. So to fix that, uh, and, and you can see it here, like if you see uh, again the data density, the usual mixture of two Gaussians that we had before, you have the true data scores in the middle, you have the estimated ones on the right. You can see that the vector fields look pretty good 
close to the two modes, uh, but they are very inaccurate uh, once you go far away, right? They, they don't quite look like the right thing once you're far away. And as a result, uh, you can imagine that the Langevin dynamics procedure will have a very hard time exploring the low data density regions and it will not be able to, uh, you know, go from pure noise to a clean image. So one way to solve this is to add noise to the data. That's another key uh, building block of these diffusion models, is to not just model the data distribution, but model the data distribution that has been perturbed with noise. And the intuition is that once you add noise, if you add a sufficiently large amount of noise, so you take an image and you literally add noise to it, like this image of the dog, you add noise to it and you get something that where you're probably destroying the structure of the data a little bit. What happens is that after, if you add a sufficiently large amount of noise, uh, then this perturb density will be supported over the whole space. Uh, we no longer have high data density regions, low data density regions. During training, we're going to see noisy data uh, because we're sampling from the perturbed data density instead of the clean data density. And as a result, our score model is going to be pretty accurate all over the space. Uh, this is good. The challenge is that we're no longer modeling the clean data density, but we're modeling an approximation, which is the data density that has been perturbed with, let's say, additive Gaussian noise. So we're not happy about it because if you if you were to do this, you know, and then you were to sample from the model, instead of generating images of dogs, you would generate image of, images of dogs plus noise, which is not quite what we want. So the other key ingredient of diffusion models is this idea of not just modeling the data distribution, not just modeling the data distribution plus noise, but modeling a sequence of data distributions that have been perturbed with increasingly large amounts of noise. So you can see my, I'm showing just three here just for visualization, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Sigma three is a a larger amount of noise compared to sigma one, and you can see that the resulting density is more spread out, right? So uh, we're going to call it p sigma one, p sigma two, p sigma three, and you can think of them as data densities corresponding to increasingly large amounts of noise, where the structure is progressively destroyed by this uh, increasingly large amounts of noise. So you can see the dog on the left, p sigma one, sigma one is very small, and then at the, at the other end, you have P sigma 3, where sigma 3 is very large and the structure is completely destroyed. It's basically pure noise at that point. And uh, what we can do is we can try to jointly estimate these vector fields of scores for all these intermediate data densities that have been perturbed with increasingly large amounts of noise. So uh, for making the things efficient, uh, we use a noise conditional score model. This is a neural network. Again, takes X as an input. It takes additionally sigma, which is the noise intensity that we're adding to the data. And as an output, it produces an estimate of the gradient for the data density convolved or perturbed with noise of intensity sigma. So it's a single neural network that is trying to jointly estimate all these vector fields. In this case, we have three. Uh, in practice, you have maybe thousands of them. And, uh, but it's a single neural network. It's trying to jointly learn all these vector fields. We train a neural network using exactly the same objective we had before. But we're now, uh, you know, we have a mixture of these score matching objectives where we're jointly trying to minimize the L2 distance between the estimated score and the ground truth score across uh, the different noise intensities. So we have, we're summing over sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and we're jointly trying all these vector. Uh, we're jointly trying to match all these vector fields using a score matching loss that we just saw before, and we weight these this, this losses according to some weighting function. Once we've learned this uh, this vector field of scores, what we can do is we can use something called annealed Langevin dynamics. Essentially, we use the procedure we talked about before. Uh, following the gradients corresponding to data densities with high amounts of noise. Then we use these particles to initialize another Langevin chain corresponding to the vector field with smaller amounts of noise. And then we use this to initialize a new chain with even less noise. And the advantage of this is that we, when we start out with high amounts of noise, the vector field is going to tell us in which direction we should go to, work, to go towards high probability regions. 
And at the same time, towards the end, we're going to be able to produce samples that are coming from uh, a data density that has been perturbed with very, very small amounts of noise. And so it's going to be effectively indistinguishable from samples from the true data density. So you can see a demo of how this works here on models trained on simple data sets, MNIST, C410. And you can see how this procedure essentially denoises pure noise into clean data. And it's essentially just the way it's doing it is by following these gradients and trying to take pure noise and transforming it into likely samples by following these gradients that have been estimated through score matching. And uh, you know this procedure uh, turned out to beat generative adversarial networks. Uh, this was kind of like the, the best uh, generative model for for many years. Uh, you know it's been engineered a lot by many of the big companies. And uh, this approach uh, was able in 2019 it was actually able to beat uh, generative adversarial networks for the first time. So that was very very exciting. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, if you do use this procedure and you train on C410 data, the images you see on the left, and you generate samples from the model, you get the results that you see on the right. So pretty images that look kind of like the ones you see on the left. And if you believe into you know, uh, the, the, this kind of quantitative metrics to evaluate sample quality, like FID scores, reception scores, uh, you see that yeah, we can beat GANs for the first time, which was very exciting. And uh, you know, it prompted a lot of groups uh, from us and from other from other uh, research groups to, to really push this uh, this idea further, trying training on more data, training on deeper architectures. Uh, and if you do that, uh, you can get uh, very good results. Here are some of the samples that you can generate on if you train a model on, on human faces. These are high resolution images, 1024 by 1024. And these people don't exist; they are synthesized by one of these. Uh, score-based diffusion generative models and here you can see more examples of the kind of really um, really high fidelity images that you can generate using score-based models. Now the final thing I wanted to mention is uh, uh, how to control the generation process right uh, so far we've said well you can train a distribution a density model using samples and then you can sample you uh, using data and you can sample from it how do you control the generative process Let's say you've trained a model over images of dogs and cats, but now you really would like the model to produce a dog because that's what you care about. And so let's say that you have some kind of classifier that can predict a label Y given an image X. How do you use this to sample from the posterior distribution of images X that correspond to some control signal Y, which in this case is, is a, let's say, a class label. Like I want an image of a dog. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, what makes score-based model great is that uh, they are very, they allow for Bayesian reasoning very efficiently. Uh, if you use Bayes rule and you try to write down an expression for the posterior over the image given the control signal, you'll see that it involves two terms in the numerator, the prior, the likelihood, which let's say are given to you. Uh, but the, 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 the tricky part in every Bayesian approach is always the denominator. It's always the marginal likelihood of the, of the observation, which again involves is basically a normalization constant, just the, like the partition function that we had before, which is intractable to evaluate. But if you look at scores, uh, again, we end up with the same uh, nice property that we had before, uh, where essentially the score, the gradient with respect to x of the denominator is zero, is a constant, because the, the, the denominator does not depend on x. It's a constant, just like the partition function, it disappears. And so to get the score of the posterior, all you have to do is to sum up the score of the prior with the score of the likelihood. And if you do that, uh, you know, you can do, essentially you can take a pre-trained generative model that has been trained over, let's say, natural images, can combine it with a likelihood model that tells you uh, how the image X is related to some control signal Y that you care about. And you can combine them to generate samples from the posterior. And you can generate images X that are consistent with some kind of measurement Y uh, that, that you, that you want to use to control the generation. And you can use this to, let's say, if Y is a stroke painting, you can use this to do 
to, to generate to generate photorealistic images that correspond to some stroke painting that is provided by the user as an input. Uh, or if you the, the kind of uh, most commonly used application of this idea is to do uh, language guided generation, text to image. How do you go from some tap prompt Y to an image X? Again, your forward model here is going to be some kind of model that tells you how consistent is an image X with some caption Y. And you can use this model, you combine it with your score based generative model over images, and you can use this to do, to do language guided generation. And uh, you know you can use it to do medical image reconstruction. Here, P of Y given X is some kind of physical simulator that tells you how the medical image is related to the kind of measurements that you get from your MRI machine. Uh, and you can use it to do very efficient uh, medical image reconstruction, for example. And uh, you know, state of they didn't, this kind of approach really gives you state-of-the-art performance on a variety of different tasks not just image generation, but text-to-speech generation, audio synthesis, material design, shape generation, um, molecular conformation prediction, time series prediction. Uh, it's really been shown to be a very, very efficient uh, way of modeling probability distribution over high dimensional spaces, whether these are images or audio or video most recently. And so it's a, it's a very exciting and very growing field, very fast growing field. And you can find this pretty cool website that covers a lot of uh, the, the, the recent developments in this, in this space. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to take a look if you wanna, wanna learn more. This was a high level kind of uh, description of some of the core ingredients that go into these models. There's of course a lot, a lot more to learn in terms of the right architecture, the right data sets to train the models. And there's been a lot of improvements from different groups uh, that I don't have time to cover in this, in this talk. Uh, but uh, hopefully this gave you a sense of the, the, the key technical approaches that underlying that underlie diffusion models and uh, yeah provide a decent introduction that then you can um, you can use to, to learn more about the specific application you care about or some some ingredients that you that you want to learn more about and uh, yeah I think uh, that's about it um, I didn't have time to talk about probability evaluation. Uh, that's another interesting properties of these models. You can allow the probability uh, of, of a particular input given the, uh, provided by the model. Uh, didn't have time to talk about it, but you can look up the, the references there if you if you want to learn more about it. And uh, yeah, I can. I think I'm out of time, but if there is still some time left, I might take some questions.